Welcome to the Serrano Brothers Podcast. We are twin brothers who are pastors in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We talk about faith, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, culture, and anything else we think is interesting. Thanks for joining. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We are continuing our interviews with Bishop pre-nominees of the Sierra Pacific Synod. Today we have the Reverend Cindy Beck. Cindy, thank you so much for coming on our on our show. Thank you for asking me and for all asking all candidates. For sure. Uh, can you tell us where you're serving and what conference you're in right now? I'm in the Bridges Conference right now. Uh, in terms of my serving, I'm serving Napa Valley Lutheran Church as their interim pastor. Uh, my membership is at St. John's in Sacramento. So I normally do, uh, actually, I do both conference meetings when I can. Very cool. Uh, 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 you, you know, rather than just kind of ask you, about your childhood or whatever like that. We, we, we want, we got a specific question for you. Okay. Um, uh, thinking back on your childhood, what's your favorite memory? And it could be either a memory associated with the church, associated without the church, um, but just what's, what's your favorite memory from childhood? Well, I think my favorite memory from childhood is I was born in Charleston, Illinois in December. So it was cold. I think that's why I like cold weather. Um, but our we lived in the parsonage across the street from the church. But the but the house was kind of the only building there for a while. So we had this huge empty lot next to us. And then the church, big lots around it. And then on that side was a cornfield. So for me, the freedom of exploration. I mean, I just remember being outside and being so happy and just, and I keep thinking, how did I survive my childhood? Because <laughs> I mean, I would just go off and, and explore. I just, to me, there was just such, in my childhood, I just think so many times of just looking up in the sky and thinking how happy I was. Mm. That's awesome. So you mentioned that you're you're uh, that you grew up in a parsonage, so you're uh, a pastor's kid then. Yes, I am. Well, is there anything you want to say about being a pastor's kid and then becoming a pastor? Um. So again, maybe a lengthy answer, but I'll just try. Yeah. To bring... so my... We got time. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I grew up Missouri Synod. And uh, my dad, the congregation in Charleston, Illinois, was a town gown. So it was both a congregation, but it also served the campus ministry at Eastern Illinois University. And, and for me, my favorite memory of the church is the smell. <laughs> you know, you would walk in and you I could smell all the crayons and all the Sunday school rooms. I mean, they were just smells. But I also loved the campus ministry stuff. I mean, hey, as a little girl being around college guys, <laughs> <laughs> I'm poor. You want to go out? You know? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and then we moved to um, Des Plaines, Illinois, where uh, dad was the associate pastor there. And I went to the um, the school that they had, Emanuel Lutheran School there. And then my dad got the call to College Station, Texas for the campus ministry position at Texas A&M University. So this meant that since dad now was pure campus ministry, we went to the um, Missouri Synod Church. Now this church was in Bryan, Texas, their sister cities. Across the street from my dad's campus ministry was Our Savior's Lutheran. I didn't know there was more than one Lutheran church, you know? So I didn't understand why we didn't go to that church, mm -hmm. but we went to the other one and I found it difficult. I mean, I liked the youth group and doing stuff, but the grownups seemed very hypocritical to me. So mm -hmm. like, cause as a girl, I couldn't acolyte. I couldn't, you couldn't do anything. Women couldn't do anything. You had to sign up for communion ahead of time. Um, and so uh, in uh, junior high and high school, I started asking questions about, you know, why this, why that? And they'd say, Cindy, just shut up and learn it the way we teach it. Mm. And so I thought, well, you're not supposed to ask questions, but I couldn't help it. I had a lot of questions. 
and I should have talked to my dad about it. And I didn't, or my mom, I just was like, God. and so we had a youth Sunday and I, and the only thing they would let me do was take up the offering because I was a girl and I smiled during that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, after the service, we were all lined up all the youth next to the pastor and they go, how sweet to have you help in worship today. What a cute little thing. Pastor was right next to me. Don't you ever let those girls participate in church again. And I'm like, going, I can hear you. <laughs> but I mean, so again, I'm just like thinking, what is the deal with church? Right? right. I mean, this is, you know, this ah. and I would go to, we would do stuff at my dad's church in the evening where there were you know, college girls, which again was a new thing at Texas A&M. Um, but it, it just was weird. So I never really talked to my dad about those things. So when I got to college, I was like, I am not going to go to church. You know, mm. I find God in the scriptures. And that's where I found my solace was the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are always about save me from my enemies. And I'm like, the people in the church, they hate me. Mm. Why? And, um, so I started, but then I missed church. So I went to the Catholic church. Nope. Went to the, a lot of Baptist church there. Nope. Uh, went to the synagogue, which I was probably my favorite, uh, went to the Unitarian church, went to, I don't remember that there was an Episcopal church, but there was a Presbyterian church and I could not find the God of scripture that I saw in scripture in any of those congregations and as a last resort, I went to my dad's because I didn't want to be known as the PK. So I hadn't right. gone to his church. I still remember sitting there listening to my dad preach. And it's not like I hadn't heard him preach before, because as a kid, we would sometimes go and I'd be like, boring. But this time I'm a college student and I'm listening and I'm like, oh my God, this is the God I've been looking for mm-hmm. coming out of my dad's mouth. And, um, I, I mean, it was like, have you ever done that crack the egg trick on somebody? Can you feel that? Right. Mm. I could feel this warmth mm. just flowing down me. And after that, I started talking to my dad a lot about, um, all this stuff. And he got me involved in Lutheran student movement, which was fantastic. I got to go all around the country meeting other Lutheran uh, college students. And that's when I found out that there were three Lutheran churches. Mm-hmm. Did that. Um, first time I ever saw a female pastor. And I'm looking at her, I'm going, fake, fake. <laughs> you uh, <know? laughs> yeah. Girls can't do that. Um, but she was so wonderful. I mean, she was, God, incredible. So, you know, I really attribute my dad as, um, you know, being the one that really pulled me back into church. And uh, when I, you know, said I was going to go to seminary, he was my biggest support. He, I mean, wow. he had such a great reputation that the Missouri Synod District President let him participate in my ordination, let wow. him participate in my wedding. Um, wow. You know, so... Well, thank you. Wow. That was, that's, that's a great, that's a really great answer. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that story. That was, uh, that was great. Do you you, kind of bring it forward? Do you have any, a lot of people don't know pastors actually get off time, right? Uh, (laughs) So like, do you have any hobbies or anything that you, that you have anything? uh, What what do you do in your off time? I I really do love to bake, uh, but um, that has calories associated with it. That um, I'm at that point where I need to just stop doing that. Although my neighbors love it because I do take a, I take them to my neighbors a lot. I, uh, I like to, uh, I've just started doing more art painting and I kind of do abstract because I don't know how to draw. Um, so can I tell you all another story real fast Please. about that? So can, so in kindergarten, first grade, I was at the Missouri Synod school you know, and um, so the teacher said, draw Jesus. I want y'all to color. She didn't say y'all. I want you you guys to uh, color Jesus and the disciples. And so I was like, oh, good. I love to color. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to color them each a different color so that all so they can all be unique. Right. So every mm-hmm. disciple has its own identity. 
And I was like, this is like the coolest picture. You know, I've got red and green and purple and yellow and orange. And she's walking by looking at everybody. And she stops and she looks at mine and she goes, she pulls it up in front of the class. She goes, this is bad. This is bad. Wow. Jesus and the disciples are white. No. Whoa. them white. I am talking to your parents about this. You are bad. So Dang. I loved coloring in art. And after that moment, I never did it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt so much shame associated with art. So for me to tell you that I'm painting and doing art, I I mean, it's really been later in my life that I've just, you know, have to say, let go of those tapes, you know, and, no. and let go of the shame and just have fun with it. So, um, so, so it's a big thing for me to be expressing myself in a way I always wanted to. So painting is a big thing. Also, I like to work with clay. So I, I do both a polymer clay that you have to bake and I do air dry clay. So things like that I like to do. I walk in the mornings. I love hiking. I love riding the bicycle. So those are things, reading. Oh, thanks. So uh, um, what are some of the what are some of the the spiritual practices that you do that you you tend to cling to and come back to over and over again walking is really a strong one um when i was on internship in iowa i went to a uh, um a franciscan uh spiritual director and i said you know i don't think i i i feel guilty i don't think i pray the way pastors are supposed to pray and so does that mean I shouldn't be a pastor? And he was like, well, tell me, you know, he goes, tell me, tell me what you did on your walk this morning. Cause I mean, we'd been talking for a long time and I said, oh, well, I'm taking a walk. And I'm like, listen, I hear a little kid laugh and I go, oh God, don't you love that sound? That is just like the greatest sound in the world to hear a kid laugh. And then I'm like, this tree's bark is so unusual. And I had to go and touch it because it was so cool. And I'm like, going, God, the way you do things, God, you know, and then I kind of, chat you know i'm in my head i'm looking at everything and appreciating it and i'm kind of just chatting with god about um you know things i need to do for the youth group or blah 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 and he goes and you don't consider that prayer mm. that's well it's in prayer that you have to get on your knees and again remember those are extended background yeah. get on your knees fold your hands and have really holy words and he says no prayer is a, is a relationship mm. and i said it's it's not a sin to have Jesus as a friend. And he goes, no, <laughs> no. He goes, you pray a lot. You just don't call it that. So for mm. me, walking and actually baking too, because baking gets me into this zone mm. where I become so calm and so, um, just so calm and just so kind of happy and thinking bigger things and conversing. So those are probably two. That's the, I think that's great. I think, I think more of us could recognize how much of a spiritual discipline walking is, right? I mean, there's even that old famous quote that's attributed to St. Augustine where it is solved by walking, you know? Uh, uh, and, and, and so to have that as a spiritual discipline, I think is a, is a really cool thing, right? Uh, Cause it's connecting the body and the heart and the soul and the mind. Uh, uh, that's really great. Thank you. Thanks for, for sharing that. You, you know, in our, in ministries, there are many uh, successes and failures that we have in ministry. Uh, there's highs and lows, and we think it's really important to hold on to our successes, right? So could you name for us, um, a success that you've had in ministry that you kind of hold on to maybe when it's, when it's not going so great. <laughs> hey, this isn't really a, a success, but because I'm in California, I'm going to say this. So one of the kids that I baptized in Texas uh, played for the Oakland athletics earlier this year. And then they sent him down to the minors again. So they are dead to me until they bring <laughs> 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 professional baseball player and I'm going oh, yeah, she put water on your head and it's just kind of very cool uh but you know 
my second call in Texas was a kind of a difficult call. I was the associate pastor. The senior pastor was the complete opposite of the prior senior pastor. And um, the congregate, he was trying to move the congregation in some ways that they were resisting. And so they were always kind of at odds with him. And so I took on uh, a project to do, and I, you know, rookie thing, I did, I got a speaker to come to a retreat, didn't think to ask how much he was going to charge us. And it ended up being a lot of money. So that was like the, a failure, but they all got mad at the senior pastor. And I said, it's not his fault. It's my fault. And they said, no, it's not. It's his. And so I said, I'd like to, you know, at the next council meeting, I'd like to talk about this. And so I had everybody in the room go around and ex say why they were mad, you know, about this. And whenever they would say something about the senior pastor, I would say, talk to me because I'm the one that did that. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for this. And at the end of that, everybody was calm. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, I mean, at the time it was scary and I was really nervous, but um I feel like that was a really success because I felt some shifting going on in the congregation then, um, both in terms of my role, um, not being just a, uh, well, I wasn't even the youth pastor, but they still kind of saw me as that. Um, but being able to move into more, what I wanted to do was, which was adult education. And so that was a success. And I think the youth trips with the kids in my first call, <sighs> Those were successes. Those are things that bring me total joy. When I look back to taking a bus from Houston to Colorado and doing service mm -hmm. projects, oh, I love them. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I before I became a pastor, I was in ministry, doing youth ministry for 13 years. Oh, wow. And sometimes I sit in my office and I relish the days and delight in the days of youth ministry um just because it was so much fun um and do, so, so, do you see them I, on facebook and they're adults with kids and you're gonna right. and i always think now you're gonna see what your parents were going through when you <laughs> thought you could sneak out a youth group you know? right absolutely come back to you <laughs> uh, Yep. Hey, little Andrew, guess what? <laughs> right. <laughs> so so in, in our church, uh, I learned recently that we have three expressions of our church, right? We have the, the, the church-wide, the synod, and then the local congregation. In your understanding, what is the primary function of the synod office? Um. That, 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 that <laughs> I, my brain was going in a different place when you were talking about the threefold expressions. So All right. I, I was, I was thinking about that because that, that would also go back to my dad talking to me about stuff, but the function of the Senate office. Um, so I've been giving this a lot, a lot of thought lately. Huh. I kind of see, I know this is, this is a kind of probably a weak analogy, but um so a, a lot of, as an interim pastor, one of the foundations for me of interim ministry is that I think of Luther's explanation to the third article, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, which is that the Holy Spirit has called, gathered, and enlightened me uh, with gifts, and in the same way has enlightened the church, and so with gifts. So I see every congregation as you are the people that God's gathered in this time and this place to do ministry, right? So in our midst already are the gifts that the Holy Spirit has brought here that can be sifted up to do ministry. So that's how I approach every interim is that that's what I'm looking for. Who are these people that are gathered? Who are they? What are the different things that they bring? And what does that say about where the Holy Spirit might lead us into, into mission? So I see every congregation that way. And I think that the role of the, um, and, and one of the things I like to do is when I say synod, I mean the members of the congregations of the geographical area. The office of the bishop, I think is to kind of help all those, 
I, I, I call the congregations, then y'all are all the different committees, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. each, each congregation is a committee, right? So all the committees that are forming this body to help them do that, to sift out and to say, what are the gifts in your midst already? And how can we facilitate um, you using those in maybe, you know, ways we hadn't thought of before? So let's say that uh, Eureka really loves climate change issues uh, with the forestation and the seas and stuff like that. And then we find out that down in Santa Cruz, they have issues with that. And you're so far apart. Well, how, what about if, since I know they both like that, how about if I help them figure out ways that they can be stronger together so that mm -hmm. it's not just within their congregations. And then maybe paradise would want to also be a part of that, you know? So I see the, the office of the bishop is doing this, the administration work that just is a necessity, I think of that. Um, and I think, but on top of the administrational stuff, I think helping with mission and serving and trying to lift up the, the ministries that all congregations have. Yeah, that's, I like that. Uh, do you, um, lots of people talk about our synod having like a strategic plan and, um, and, I, and, I, and I, of course, it would take time knowing what the strategic plan would be, obviously. But but how would you go about as bishop making a strategic plan? How would you how would that pro, how would you imagine that kind of process playing out for you? Not what what is the strategic plan, right. but how would you go about making it happen? That's that's what that's really kind of what I was talking about when I was saying icebreakers and uh, potlucks. Uh, see, here's how it's always worked, right? The bishop comes up with a strategic plan and tells everybody, this is our plan. This is who you are. As an interim, I say, you need to figure out who you are, right? So let's suss out who you are. And I do that with congregations. I, and I always tell congregations, they never, ever believe me. <laughs> they never believe me. I go, trust me, you as the members have more power than your pastor does. Your pastor might have authority but y'all are the ones with the power because suppose that you're, um, and this is why I tell them we need to do the interim work. So if you don't want to do the interim work, we're not going to suss out your passion of, for ministry. So say you really do have a passion for low cost housing in your area, but you know, you really haven't committed to it or something. And your pastor comes in and says, we are going to be a congregation for refugees and this is what we're going to do. And we're also going to do a, a, a recycling. And the, if you, the congregation, don't want to do that, it's not going to happen. Your right. pastor will try everything. Your pastor will work his, his herds, their tail off, trying to make this their strategic mission happen. But you have the power to keep it from happening. Mm -hmm. So if you know your mission, then you know what kind of a pastor to call to help you walk with you in that mission. So I think I would like the strategic plan to come from the congregations in mm -hmm. our synod, which would mean, like I say, meeting in groups. And it's going to take time and it's going to require people to make sacrifices of time. Um, if if I had my dream, I would love to be able to pay mileage for people <laughs> to, mm. you know, travel to events um, because some congregations are going to have to go long distances. But I would love to meet with groups of congregations around the synod and, and have them talk about their dreams. Where are they at? What is it that they would like to see a united, um, you know, kind of a, a as close to a united mission as we could come up with because so I would like the strategic plan to come from the bottom up. And you said, and you said you would do it through icebreakers and potlucks. Is that what I, <laughs> that, that, I felt like something. So icebreakers being like icebreaker games, that kind of thing. So I mean, getting to know each other. Yes. So getting, okay. I see. So like I see um, all the congregations, Eureka, Fortuna, um, you know, all those up there getting together for a meal, I'll be there. I want to be at all of these. 
and have them introduce each other, maybe do a couple of uh, talking with one another to get to know each other and uh, becoming more comfortable with that and then being able to talk about some things. And it's, you know, you're probably going to have to do that several times. I mean, it's not going to happen once. But but what I'm thinking of is that there's so much fear and anxiety in the synod. And we fear the unknown. We fear uh, things that feel out of our control. And so if you can come together and start to get to know people, and I think it would be great if you get to know people that are different than you are and find out that they may have different political views, but they share uh, Christian faith and values and that you can talk to understand instead of talk to win an argument, then you are acting in a very disciple way. Mm. And um, so I think it could bring the fear and anxiety down by doing this because you're having more confidence of being able to work beyond your four walls and um, confidence that you're being heard that you're being heard and that you're being valued, even when uh, your viewpoint is different from somebody else's. You know, I really like to facilitate being able to talk about things that are different and make it be to understand instead of to win. So that that's what I mean by icebreakers and potlucks because eating together is a very Jesus thing. It's one of the things I love about him. And he ate carbs, bread. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it would let me bake. I could bring baked goods, you know. <laughs> uh, um, well, we appreciate the baked goods. Uh, <laughs> in your paperwork, you wrote um you lift up the focus that or or, or yeah li- what we need is lifting up the focus that all we do arises out of our response to what God has done for us in Christ. We have no reason to gather if it's not to share and celebrate our faith. Um can, can you expand on that more? Uh and help me understand what you meant by that and then how how does that actually take shape at the synod synod level? I think what I was thinking about are the congregations that um, that their primary focus is to meet for the coffee and fellowship, you know, and that's mm-hmm. fine. That is part of discipleship too. But I also want them to be there with the sense of, and that's I guess that's my stewardship thing. God created us as relational beings. So we're we're created to be in relationship to one another, to God, to the world, to the environment and everything. And um, but I think as you know, the Imago Day, we're created to reveal, to <laughs> to reveal the good news of how God has acted and that this creator God squeezed into this tiny human form in order to speak to us more clearly and more directly. And what we hear is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that God loves us and that all these people that are marginalized that nobody else wants to look at or see are invited, not only just invited, but they're welcomed. I mean, they are um, they are an important part of all of this. And I think we have that unique message. And so mm-hmm. What God has done for us is create life, uh, create us in relationship, has sent us a savior that that spoke to us. And in response to this uh, death uh, and resurrection of Jesus, we respond with living, living out the words that uh, Jesus has done and provided. And that means a little more than just sitting every Sunday in your pew. I just think it means a little more than that. I think it means, if anything, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like the prayer thing. It can mean something like if you wear a cross, wear it knowing that people will see it and wonder if you're a Christian. And so behave like you're a Christian, you know, and so that you can be planting seeds all the time. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, I think, what I mean. It's I guess I shouldn't say there's no reason to gather, but I don't think it's as um, meaningful if we're just gathering just to 
have coffee because I'm alone. Although that, again, that's a value, valuable thing too. So, but it's important to name that, right? It's important to name why we gather and, and we're not just a social club. Amen. We're not, we're not just a Quanas, you know? Uh, and, and so to be very intentional about why we do what we do, I think is a really important. And I think you name that very well. Uh, because yeah, that's so th so thank you for saying that. Yeah. I think um one of the things that we uh that you have if you were to be bishop, uh, is that you are obviously gonna need a staff, right? Yes. And so what gifts do your synod staff need to have? in order to complement your own style? Attention to detail. Okay. Um, better administration skills. Uh, so I really do want somebody with administration skills, with an attention to detail that, um, I also want people that are not yes people because I really value people saying, ah, yeah, that's, that sounds okay, but have you ever thought about oh my gosh, there's so many things I haven't thought about. And other people have great ideas. And I like that kind of discussion. So I want people that are willing to, to talk and to uh, really do that kind of collaborative stuff to take something that's thrown out and work with it and mold and come up with something different. So yeah, people that can keep me on track, you know, hey, you remember you got this appointment or, you know, uh, just help me figure out how to do that. Not that I don't do that now, but um, yeah, I think working very collaboratively. I want people that, I would like people that that want to work with congregations. And, and, and I guess one of the things I'm very aware of is that I'm not, I'm, I'm not completely clear on what are the, the larger synodical um, entities that need to be, like I know that there are the discipleship teams you know, so how do we relate to that? I, you know, I'd have to figure out how to relate to the, the discipleship teams, how to relate to our synod partners and mission partners and universities, things like that. So that's, that would be a learning curve for me, but make sure that there are people that want to be in those relationships. Yeah. Do you, um, do you think, okay, so the, the next one is, uh, um, one of the, the most important times for a bishop um, to be present is to really show, uh, and this, show the connectedness of the civic office is, is when there's like conflict in a congregation. It's really important for the bishop's office to kind of come in and help out with that. Um, whether it's conflict between a pastor and a congregation or amongst a council, you know, there's all kinds of iterations of conflict that I'm sure you've seen as well as, as being an, an interim. What do you think your style of conflict resolution is? And, and, and as Bishop, how do you see yourself involved in those situations or handling that kind of conflict? Um, uh, by being present. I mm -hmm. mean, I think being present is important. Listening and then feeding back is important to make sure that what you've heard is agrees with what they think they're saying. Um, one, <laughs> I also like to do, I, I like to offer up alternatives as I listen. You know, have you ever, you know, have we thought about this because uh, perspectives are different. So how do we take into account that, you know, somebody's looking down and seeing a six and somebody's looking down and seeing a nine. You know, so how do how do we take those things into account so that we can open ourselves to again letting go of a need to be right and win this fight, win this conflict, and understand? So my my goal is trying to help people understand while at the same time as a bishop saying there are behaviors that we are accountable for. Jesus, Jesus has listed some, you know, the Bible has 10 that they keep repeating over and over again. Like they're a big deal. We call them great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that 
reminding them that that our behavior in conflict is the most important time that we show the world why we are different, how we are different, because we're doing it the way Jesus has kind of talked about. Coming up this Sunday, is, or, or is it this Sunday or next Sunday, Matthew 18? Uh, it's not this Sunday, but but maybe next Sunday. For those of us who don't know, what is Matthew 18? I know what it is, but for those of us who don't. Uh... Oh, if you have a conflict with someone, go and talk to that person. And if that person does not listen to you, then bring two or three others that they may witness. There's a lot in, in that. Um, uh, there's so much in that passage. For one thing, and one thing, it's in most constitutions, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, oh, It is. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that part of that when they say two or three witnesses, you've got to remember that that's the Judaic um, understanding of valid validity is that you need two or three witnesses. Um, I don't like the um, translation that I think Sundays in Season has, which is go and tell that person their fault, F-A-U-L-T. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, you know, so I looked that up yesterday in the Greek and the Hebrew, and it's a lot, it, it's less damning and more relational when mm -hmm. it's uh, defined more like how the Greek word uses it. Um, but the, the idea is talk to somebody, you know, talk one-on-one. -on -one. We like to go out into the parking lot and tell the two or three that are gathered, you know, about that person. That's because that brings stability, right? If I share it with two people that agree with me, I become more centered again. Mm. But that's just dealing with anxiety. That's not solving a problem. So I think it, we need to be direct in that. Um, it is never helpful if you have a problem with somebody to go and to talk to friends about it and not to the person, right? I mean, I think that's what Jesus is trying to get at and what you're saying as well um yeah one of the, one of the, go ahead no no please but one of the other things about working with conflict is that sometimes you just have to also say this this didn't go well you know and i did the best i could and if people refuse to listen or to uh, not participate or to say, yes, you heard us perfectly. And then I make a suggestion that's different than the one that they want. They go, you didn't hear me at all. And I'm like, you, didn't, you know, so sometimes it's, that's our world. You know, sometimes it's just hard. So I remember Pete Steinke said that, uh, for those that don't know, Pete Steinke was a, a well-known consultant in the church world for conflicts and, and working with things like this. And so somebody, he goes, I get asked all the time, what's, what's your percentage rate of success in congregations? And he goes, and I used to answer, oh, you know, 30 or 40%, which is unexpected because he's so smart and good. And he said, and then I started thinking about the question. And the next time somebody asked me, what's your success rate at congregations? He goes, 100%. And people go, wow, that's really good. And he goes, I did my work 100% of the time. It didn't change the situation 100% of the time but I did what I was supposed to do. And so that, that has given me a uh, consolation in the congregations where um, I've worked hard and they're like, God, she's so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Pastor Cindy, as you were um, thinking about coming onto the podcast, is there any question that you were hoping that we 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 would ask you should is there a question we should ask you i i i was just hoping that there would be kind of a, a spectrum you know like some personal things and some professional things and i think y'all did that very very well excuse me that's can't turn that off <laughs> just ignore it it's just my mom <laughs> <laughs> literally it is my mom <laughs> Do you have anything else that you we, you'd like us to know about you as relates to being bishop? This is your time. Yes, We're giving I, you kind of the final word. Yeah, I this is something. So when my name came up at the last bishop's election, um, 
you know, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I, so I was glad that I was so glad that I only got up to like number nine and they took the top seven. Now, having said that, I got up to number nine. That was with like seven votes. OK, so <laughs> it's not like that. So this time around, too, I was like, oh, I don't want to do it. And really had to start saying, why do you keep telling people that? And it's because of insecurity and fear. You know, am I which which is the same thing I went through with my call to be a pastor, you know? Um, and, and once I realized that while well, I'm doing the same thing I did, which is, I think, in a good good um, prophetic way, like Moses, I have five reasons why you should not have me do this, you mm -hmm. know? And Jonah, no, no, I would rather run away and be in the belly of a fish than do what you want, God. And then Elijah, I did what you want, just kill me now. You know, mm -hmm. so the prophets are, are you know, kind of like that. So I started really thinking about it. And on my walks, just things just kept happening in my in my head or as I would walk, I would end up talking to strangers. I mean, not about anything, but I mean, just it just became clear to me that I am being called to this hmm. and that I do think I have something to offer. So I have gone on a real journey of discernment from kind of where I started from and where I am now to saying, I, yeah, I mean, and it's, and when you talked about the three expressions of the church, where I was thinking of is how my dad always said, you know, a call isn't just an internal one. You know, the church also validates your call. And yeah. so right now I'm like, you know, I do feel called to this. I think as an interim, I think I have a unique vision and way that I would do things. On the other hand, that just might be an internal call. Mm -hmm. And if the church doesn't call me, that's okay. I mean, that's, I want, I want the spirit of God to, to do the, the work. And that doesn't always mean me. My, um, my amen mother, yeah. pardon? I said, amen to that, you yeah. know, like, amen. I think that's really, yeah. well, that's kind of the long form questions we have. Um, Josh is going to take on our lightning round. He's going to ask you questions. Is there a I mean, prize? <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody wins because they get to know you a little better. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> All right. I wish I had a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First, first question. What food could you eat every day? Uh, onion rings. Right. What is your favorite movie genre? Classic movies. Uh, I love movies from the 20s, 30s, 40s. I'll go into the 50s and 60s. Awesome. Uh, salty, sweet, or savory? It, it, it That varies by mood, but sweet or salty. And nice. together... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like chocolate covered pretzels, sweet and salty. Yum, yum. Yep, yep. Uh, okay, so in addition to the Bible, because every pastor would just say the Bible, what book would you like with you on a deserted island? Oh, golly. So many good books. Oh, I can't even, I know this is going to sound stupid maybe, but either La, La Miserable, I really love that book. Victor Hugo, oh, yes. That was such a good book, so much good stuff. Or I'm going to say some British cozy mystery <laughs> that I'll read. And then two weeks later, I'm like, I don't remember who, who the guy was. I'll read it again. <laughs> <laughs> Both good answers. Um, okay, what fills your cup? Uh, uh being with being with friends, being with colleagues, uh, I always come away energized. Um, just being out with people. Uh, then again, baking and walking also energize me. Riding my bike energizes me. I love talking to strangers. That energizes me. And and in a similar way, what depletes your cup? L looking at numbers. Um, and, and having to figure out uh, those kinds of things, sorting through the stacks of papers that I accumulate, because I always said, it, I always say, I'm going to put them in piles. So they're separated, but they end up in one. I'm going, 
okay, council minutes, worship and music minutes. Uh, that depletes me. And that's my own fault. Cleaning, cleaning depletes me. <laughs> what is your favorite holy place? Outside. What's one good piece of advice you've been given? I, I think I had this in my paper, but maybe not. Uh, what my dad said to me, which is, Anytime, you know, whenever you're discouraged about things, Cindy, remember that whatever humanity is tearing down, God is building back up again. Hmm. Hmm. What does rest look like for you? Sitting in the comfy chair with uh, my cat sleeping next to me and reading or, yeah, maybe draw or playing, <laughs> playing, playing spider solitaire. <laughs> and this is the last question on that day uh what do you hope god will say to you when you enter the pearly gates <laughs> you made me laugh <laughs> <laughs> i've always said i'd kind of like that on my tombstone she made me laugh <laughs> well you have definitely made us laugh today uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Cindy, for being on our podcast. Thank y'all so much. This has been the Serrano Brothers podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>